Ashley, are there more people that will join or just the, the two that I see so far here? As of right now, we just have the two, but as I see them coming into the waiting room, I will admit them in. Okay, so I will start. It's six o'clock, yep. Okay. Hello, my name is Tony Guerrero. I'm with Greer Galloway, and I'm happy to be working with the city of Kawartha Lakes on a project for the Omimi wastewater treatment system. Um, I will mention that this is being recorded and it will, uh, it's also live on the municipal YouTube channel. Um, so we're going we're gonna to talk about the system. I'll give you an overview and uh, give you some of the background and, and what we found and what, what we think we need to do to move forward. And then uh, if you have questions along the way, that's fine because it's a very small group. I don't mind, uh, I don't mind you, uh, uh, you know, politely interrupting me and, and we'll, uh, we'll talk about it. And if you prefer to wait till the end, we'll open it up for questions at the end as well. I, I anticipate the slide portion, you know, is maybe a 15 to 20 minute uh, talk and then uh, lots, of, lots of time for discussion if you like. So uh, without further ado, um, Samuel, if we can move on to our opening slide, please. Thank you. So the Omimi, uh, wastewater treatment system was, was installed in approximately 1976, and it consists of uh, two lagoons as well as a spray irrigation system. So wastewater enters the lagoons and it's stored over the winter period. And in the summer, it's sprayed, uh, it's called spray irrigation. It's, it's fairly common, commonly used. Um, and you, you basically spray the effluent out onto licensed fields and uh, some of it, it evaporates and some of it uh, percolates down into the ground. Um, so other ways they operate lagoon systems, sometimes they're just discharged to surface water. Um, in this case, again, it's, uh, it, it's spray irrigation that's used. Uh, the problem that the Omimi was having was the, uh, the system was basically over capacity. So, um, sometimes they, because you can only spray in the summer, or I, I should say over like in warmer weather months. So they had about a six month window when they can spray the effluent onto the ground during the, uh, the other six months, uh, you, you have to actually be able to store all the effluent that's coming in. So you have to spray a hundred percent of the, the yearly effluent over a six month period. Uh, the spray out part was fine. It was the try, trying to store the rest of it during the, the winter that was becoming a problem. So in addition to that, uh, the city of Kawartha Lakes had done a growth management strategy or, or plan that forecasted uh, substantial growth in the Omimi area. So based on those two reasons, the city entered into a, or they they looked at different options for expanding the system. They did a class environmental assessment, I believe in 2007, that looked at pumping all of the effluent to, uh, to Lindsay, which is quite a distance and quite an expense. There was a fair amount of opposition to that. And uh, ultimately they, they did an addendum to the class environmental assessment. And the preferred solution was to, to uh, keep the effluent on the site. So instead of the spray irrigation system, they went to a similar system where it's injected under the ground. So that was basically, it's a large, very large septic bed. It's called a, uh, a large subsurface disposal system. So when you inject under the ground, you can, uh, you can run it all year, like a septic system. Um, so that was, that was chosen as a preferred solution. That was gonna be a, it's kind of a modular system that can be expanded. It was going to give the, uh, the community enough capacity in the short term for some limited growth, as well as uh, providing enough capacity to treat their existing flows. Uh, as I mentioned before, the lagoons were filling up in the winter, and they were they were going to have they had to sometimes bypass them to the uh, the Pigeon River through their through a through a licensed channel that was part of their their uh, license system, 
However, you know, the prefer you're, they were supposed to be spray irrigating. That's the preferred method. They were not supposed to consistently use an overflow. So uh, preferred solution was this large subsurface large subsurface disposal system, which we'll have call an LSSD, so I don't keep stammering over it. And that was constructed and completed in 2014. So system ran for a while, but uh, uh, it didn't operate the way it was supposed to. So there was not as much capacity available uh, for a number of reasons. Uh, the lagoon effluent was not as clean as initially anticipated and it was causing some problems. So some of the problems were uh, certainly fouling of the pumps. That was an operational issue. And some of that fouling ended up getting up into the, uh, the, the spray bed, sorry, the, uh, the LSSD. And it was clogging up the sand layer, um, which was causing some breakouts at the top. Also, uh, the, 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 the earth below, or the yeah the the the, the sub the uh, subsoil was not consistent and uh, some was it, it didn't allow the percolation rate that was initially uh, anticipated in the design. So basically, they couldn't get enough uh, they couldn't get enough of the stuff into the ground by injecting it, and instead of uh, phasing out the sub the uh, spray irrigation system, which was supposed to happen by the end of about 2015, they had to keep the spray irrigation system running. So currently they're actually both using portions of both systems. So the large subsurface disposal system is still uh, operating, but it's at a much lower capacity. So they, they operate that system during portions of the year when they're not able to spray. And then during the summer months, they operate the spray irrigation system. Um, since that time, it, the growth forecast for Omimi is uh, the original growth forecast. It, it's thought to be higher, I guess, than than initially uh, that's current than currently is practical. So um, Omimi doesn't really require all the growth that was originally forecast, and because the initial system isn't working as, as it was supposed to, and the growth forecast is potentially, well, it is gonna be lower than initially forecast. The city's looking at different ways to, uh, to kind of move forward. The Ministry of Environment, because the initial, the initial Class EA called for the, uh, the LSSD to be installed and the, the uh, previous, spray irrigation system to be decommissioned. If, if the city's gonna leave, they, they want this, the system decommissioned um, until the city redoes the class EA. So the city and Greer Galloway are reviewing the current system to determine the best, best path forward, as I mentioned. And these upgrades and recommendations will be carried out as an amendment, actually as a new, sorry, uh, class environmental assessment. Uh, it will be, a, it's a schedule C project um, that requires several steps of public consultation. This is, uh, this is one of those steps. So I'd like to move to the next slide, please. So this is an air shot of the existing system. You see the two lagoons that have been in place, place for quite some time on the right-hand side of the screen. So the, uh, the final pumping chamber in Omimi uh, puts everything up a forest main that, that comes up to... Uh, Beaver Road and enters uh, one of these two cells. From the cells, by gravity, things go to a central pumping chamber, which is essentially in the middle of that screen. And you can't see my cursor, so I won't bother pointing at it. But you can see the two blue lines, and there's a pumping pumping chamber in the middle. Um, from that's the one. Thank you. From there, uh, initially they pump to. Uh, the spray irrigation fields. So there was one, there were two fields, a north field and a south field. The south field is the one with the blue lines on it now. So that, that became the LSSD. You can still see the north field. It looks like crop circles up, uh, there's three of them, yep. So th those are the, uh, the spray irrigation fields. Uh, they call that the north field. So that, that's still in use. Um, there's nothing wrong with it. Um, 
it works and it continues to work. The south field, again, there were more circles, but they appeared, they've been wiped out by these, uh, the area with the blue lines, which is a substantial area, by the way. It's, it's uh, you know, a few football fields up there for sure. Um, that system now the, where the blue lines are, that's 24 individual uh, beds, LSSD beds. So there's sort of 24 modules. Um, there, you can install more modules if, if necessary in the future. So it's kind of a modular system. So we, this is what's currently running. There, some, of the, some of the effluent goes to the LSSD, the rest of it goes to the spray irrigation system. As I mentioned before, that's not what's it, what, what was it forecast in the init, initial uh, class EA, which is you know still on record with the MOE. That's what the, the Ministry of Environment, sorry, that's what they've approved. And in order to do something that they have not approved, we have to redo the class environmental study. So that brings us here today. Um, can you move on please, Sam? So yeah, some of the limitations that we've kind of talked about here, but some of the limitations of the existing LSSD, um, which weren't, uh, weren't anticipated, I guess, uh, that there's a lot of suspended solids in particularly in different times of the year um, in the in the lagoon effluent. So you get effluent from the lagoons and it's got got a lot of uh, kind of algae and, and different different suspended solids in it. And it, it was forming quite a film on the pumps that that feed the beds. So the pumps were clogging. That was a that was a big problem for the operational staff. We were they were clogging up pumps and uh, burning out pumps. Um, the entire pumping chamber gets gets clogged up, uh, so they were having to clean that out. It was a confined space, not not a pleasant job at all, um, and a, you know labor intensive, a very dirty job. And then uh, from there, it gets pumped up to the up to the beds, and it was also clogging the beds. So there was a kind of a slimy material on top of the bed, so at the interface between the, the bed and the and the sand below. And that was clogging up rather rather quickly, and we were we were seeing breakout at, right at the top, uh, breakout of effluent popping out of the ground. So that was at the design rate of the system. So we had to they had to turn the the pumping rate down quite a bit lower than what it was originally supposed to function at, approximately thirty percent. Um, at that rate, it, it seems uh, you know it, it operates fine the way it is now, but at that rate they cannot they cannot put out the effluent that's coming into the lagoons. Thus, their uh, their need to keep both of the systems running. Uh, the soil compos composition in that area was found to be um, it, lo it looks good on top, but I think as as you uh, as you get down lower into the hill, there are different sills of material that were not allowing the percolation rates that were. The, like the design percolation rates. So uh, due to the lower permeability than uh, that was anticipated the, and the fouling that was happening with the, the suspended solids, um, basically they just could not get the flow into the hill that, uh, that they needed to. So uh, we can move on please, Sam. All right, so this is what's currently running. We have a the lagoon, of course, there are two of them, and the intake chamber. There are screens on the intake chamber as well, like uh, fixed screens. Uh, there's a series of two big fixed screens, but they, they catch the larger material, but it's sort of the really small stuff that you can't possibly filter out with a, uh, with a fixed screen. That are, that, that's the stuff that's clogging up the, the beds and, and the pumps. So uh, from there, there are pumps and we go, um, we actually go through those fixed screens that I'm talking about and then into a wet well. And from the wet well, we can go to the irrigation system up on a hill. There's one set of pumps for that. Um, and then that, sorry, that, that actually goes to the, yeah, the, that's the, the initial pump that goes to the uh, spray irrigation system, uh, the north system, which was, the existing system prior to the upgrade. 
and there are smaller pumps that feed the large subsurface disposal system. And they pump up through a distribution box or, or a set of distribution boxes. And then again, are distributed into 24 individual tile beds. So that's what's there now. And that is all running. Um, can we go on to the next one, Sam, please? Thank you. So we've looked at different strategies to, to make this thing work more consistently and, and be more operator friendly and uh, sort of spend the least amount of money uh, to, to get a good system that will is sustainable and, and will provide the capacity required for Omimi with, with some room for uh, potential future growth. Um, so we looked at, uh, to, we, need, we need to get the suspended solids out of the effluent before it goes up to the, to the beds and through those pumps. So we looked at different ways to do that. Um, we looked at self-cleaning cloth filters, but it doesn't, it doesn't perform, it doesn't remove enough. You, you need large filters to remove enough of the material that we're, we're trying to uh, remove. Um, and it would require chemical addition and it would be fairly labor intensive and, and fairly expensive. So we looked at an auto cleaning strainer. Also, it just didn't remove the material that we, enough material and was it was still, yeah, it was, it was ineffective. We did a, a sort of a, well, not sort of, we did a pilot study. We brought in what they call a, a dissolved air flotation device. So uh, the DAF was pretty, was very effective. It handled uh, different, um, as I mentioned the, in one of the slides, we found that the, some, during some periods, the effluent was quite good, but we'd get turnover, you know, different weather uh, uh, and, and the lagoons would kind of turn over and we'd get big slugs of, of very, uh, basically dirty material uh, with a lot of high TSS, high, high total suspended solids. It would, it would just, you know, very, very quickly start uh, plugging up the system. So we, we noted that when we were doing the pilot, actually, because it was, somebody was on the site watching for a long period of time. The, the DAF, or the dissolved uh, air flotation system, was very effective at handling those spikes. Um, now, downside of the DAF, it's not an inexpensive system. Uh, it does require building additional power um, and, and tanks, but it was it was very very effective. Um, we also looked at uh, a traveling screen. This would be something that's likely likely operated in conjunction with the DAF system. So the DAF removes the smaller bits, and the traveling screen would replace the large fixed screens that are in place now, the ones that clog constantly. Um, when I say large, they're heavy. You need a, a small crane or a, a, a davit with a with a, a lifting device to to remove them. It's a, a, a job that requires several people. It's over an open tank. It's it's not a it's not a pleasant job either. Um, and again, they frequently they frequently clog. So yeah, we kind of looked at all those devices, and we'll talk about the preferred system here. Uh, but I'm going to go over a few more items, sort of post problems that we're what we're having. Can we are there, the, we experience? Sorry. Uh, so we also looked at potentially putting a larger two-stage tank to increase the amount of time for suspended substances to settle out. That was not going to be that effective. Um, we looked at uh, we're, we may need new pumps. You know, we consider putting pumps in that would just not clog. There are non-clogging pumps that we could have used. However, that was just going to clog the the beds more quickly. So, if we're already having a bed problem, clogging problem with the with the existing pumps and strainers, just bypassing all that and firing more suspend, suspended solids up there was not going to be a sustainable solution either. Uh, however, we may we may need new pumps to replace the ones that were in there because we we had burned out a lot of pumps and uh, these ones are likely not in great shape either. Uh, we would need to replace the six-way distribution valves. Uh, we found that they were they were not maintenance friendly and they were not reliable. They uh, 
we weren't getting necessarily a positive distribution to to each bed. We we think they were leaking by, and we were when we were trying to to uh, to dose one bed. I believe we were dosing more than one bed at one time. So what we propose there is to actually get rid of those valves and put put two you know on off valves. So uh, an electric valve that's either open or closed. So when we want to when we want to dose one bed, we will open that valve only and only dose that bed. The other ones were not an electric valve; they were an hydraulic valve. They are common in in uh, septic distribution systems, but we we did find they were uh, they were a maintenance problem here. Uh, I mentioned before the the existing beds operate reasonably well at a lower flow rate. We we do need to clean up the effluent that's going to them; otherwise, they will degrade over time. So uh, we in order to keep the existing beds going, we would have to reduce the, uh, the flow rate going to them uh, just because the, the ground beneath is, is not uh, as permeable as was anticipated. Uh, so we, we, we are, as I said before, we have been, they have been continuing to use this, the existing spray irrigation system to supplement the LSSD system because of the, uh, the deficiencies within the system. So we'd like to, we, we looked at all that and we're trying to, again, we're trying to put a system together that's cost effective, um, you know, environmentally sound and uh, sustainable, which would provide growth for the community and, and uh, also satisfy the Ministry of Environment, which, as I mentioned before, because, because we are operating essentially outside of their, their ECA, with their knowledge, of course, that the ministry understands what, what's going on, but uh, we can't continue to operate this way. They, uh, they, need, they need a long-term solution. So if, if we can move on, Sam, please. Thank you. So what, we're, uh, what has been discussed and, and what seems to be the most uh, uh, viable solution at this time would be to basically just leave what's in place now. You know, it, it all, it's been running for years. It works. Um, the one big addition would be the, uh, the, the replacement of the existing screening system, which is a fixed screen, again, not operator friendly, um, with a traveling screen, which, uh, you know, the, the, the material, the larger material will be mechanically removed and deposited into a bin. So it's a self-cleaning screen, essentially. And then the uh, storage tank for that material. And then the big upgrade would be the dissolved, uh, the dissolved air flotation device, the DAF. So that's going to remove your, float, your small particles. Um, so that's the larger expense. But until you get rid of those small particles, the LSSD is just going to continue to plug. And it'll, it'll just degrade over time. So the DAF removes the stuff that's clogging up the bed. Um, the, uh, the existing bed continues to operate as it is now, which is at a reduced rate of approximately 350 cubic meters a day. And then that is, uh, that is enough uh, capacity that in conjunction with the, the existing capacity that is in, uh, available within the spray irrigation system uh, that that provides a long-term solution for the community. Um, it's also a modular system so that if if additional growth was uh, uh, you know comes to fruition it would be it would be still achievable through this system. Uh, you would have to put in more beds more of the LSSD beds. Um, just to give you a, a feel for or the capacity increase, the uh, the system we're proposing should provide for uh, approximately 370 additional homes in the village. Um, so it's, it's that's quite a few more homes than, than currently are on the docket, and uh, um, you know you know it's a fairly high high growth percentage for the for the community. So it gets you out of your, the, the current jam. Um, uh, satisfies the MOE and provides provides growth for uh, for the future. So 
So we can move on, please. Yeah. Okay, none of this comes without a cost. This is, a, I'm gonna mention like a high level cost estimate because this is a, kind of an early stage of the, of the class EA. So the next, the next we'll, we'll talk about this for a minute first and then we'll, uh, we'll move on and go through the cost. But the next phase of the EA will be, will be to uh, do some, some environmental studies like to, to prove, just to prove that there are no uh, concerns. So more of a, more of a detailed study on, uh, I'll mention too, sorry, should have mentioned. The large subsurface disposal system has ground monitor, uh, ground water monitoring wells surrounding it, just to make sure that the system is not polluting off site. Um, it's kind of like a landfill in that regard. You're not allowed to pollute beyond the property line or you know you don't want to you don't want to um, yeah pollute the groundwater so they they monitor this regularly so that the there have been no impacts to the groundwater surrounding the system um, but that that kind of thing will need to be looked at in detail um, any aerosol effects of the spray irrigation system are minimal because it's for one thing it's quite a distance from uh, from nearby homes, but uh, that that kind of thing would need to be presented in detail to the MOE and to the public. Um, so that would be presented in a in a future public information center when we look at the sort of the preferred design. Um, so back to the costs uh, again, high level cost, but uh, you don't want to be you never want to be low. On, on your costs, it's, it's a painful experience. I've been there. So, pre-treatment system, the traveling screen, it's about a hundred thousand dollar piece of equipment, the less. So, I've got sort of double it for uh, installation costs, which is typically what we see in a sort of broad sense. Um, sludge storage tank and disposal system. Uh, again, it's probably a hundred thousand dollar worth of uh, infrastructure. I've I've put some extra in there. DAF package is about a uh, $300, $300,000 package, uh, roughly $100,000 to install. Uh, concrete block building sounds expensive, $400,000, but anybody that's familiar with building right now, um, you can't build much for, for less than $400,000. Uh, some changes to the existing wet well to make it feasible. This goes in part and parcel with the next line as well, the modifications to the existing pumping station. So right now they can only pump to the bed or to the large subsurface disposal system. So the intent would be to pump to the large sub subsurface disposal system all year long at 350 cubic meters a day, and then pump to the bed only during the, uh, the six months where you're, you're able to uh, uh, spray irrigate. So some modifications there totaling roughly $300,000 and then the $100,000 to improve the distribution system on the, the uh, effluent that comes from the tanks and goes to the, uh, from the pumping station, sorry, and goes to the, uh, the LSSD. As I mentioned before, the distribution files were not reliable. So total projected cost of approximately $1.7 and, and again, that's an early, an early cost. So that'll be refined during future, future stages. So that's it for that stage or that slide. Thank you. So the next steps would be to confirm that the alternatives uh, that we suggest be implemented are are acceptable, and confirm confirm through further studies. Confirm the details of the design for the new stages that uh, are proposed to be implemented and identify operational procedure for using the spray irrigation system in conjunction with the LSSD. So that's just some design issues to be worked out. As I mentioned, they currently cannot be operated in uh, um, concurrently. So that essentially concludes the, uh, the, uh, the presentation. Um, yeah, I think at this time I'd like to, I'd like to open it up to, uh, to comments or or uh, any questions that any of you have, and, and appreciate listening to me for 
30 minutes here. I'm going to talk a little longer than what I mentioned. Thank you. So I think if any, like, again, there's, we're a small group here. So uh, if you, if you just have a question or a comment, feel free to unmute and, and uh, please, please go. I have a question there, Tony, if I could. Certainly. Oh, it's Ron Ashmore, Councillor Ward 6 for the area. Um, just getting back on the history of this, and um, sorry, I had to go up my attic here to get some connection, so, and uh, I think you can hear me okay. Um, yeah. Just going back on the history of this, like we're at this situation now where like we spent, I think it was five or six million dollars back within the last 10 years to have a system that was supposed to work. And then it ended up being in litigation and, and, and uh, for the workmanship that was done. I don't know. I can't remember who did it, but that, that particular company that did that work, are they not, um, will they not honor that um, warranty work that they, uh, they did this and if they're responsible for it, and maybe one, he could enlighten us on that. But I just think that the, the company who did that and, and uh, should be responsible for at least correcting the situation now. So, uh, I, sorry, Tony, if I could just jump in, and can you guys hear me okay? So uh, there, there was a lot of players involved. Uh, there's a lot of history on that past design. Uh, we had uh, two engineering firms, uh, we had a contractor, we had existing soils. So the existing, uh, in a, a short form, uh, we utilize it, as Tony mentioned, it's an existing, it's a glorified septic system or septic bed. Uh, and we utilized soils that were native to the area and that's how they were constructed, right? So the, the main cause of the, um, uh, of the failure, I guess, it, where it's twofold. One, there was a, a buildup of scum or whatever uh, clogging the system and the native soils weren't conducive, uh, weren't suitable for the uh, infiltration that was required, right? So it's, that was really the failure, right? It's the failure of the soil materials on site. Uh, and the city owns the land. So it's our material, right? I, I, it's a little bit more um, detailed than that, but that's it, that's it in a nutshell. Uh, and we are under litigation. Uh, it, we, we've settled, I believe. Uh, but any information regarding uh, the litigation would have to go through our city solicitor. Uh, it, it's really not the intent of this meeting. No, I understand. Okay. Uh, I have a question on the tank. How, how, maybe I missed it, but how big would that tank, how much would that tank hold, that holding tank there, uh, you, uh, Tony, there you had, you had mentioned? Yeah, it was. It, it's not a, an extremely large tank. We were just looking at something to give us a little bit of a buffer between the dissolved, uh, the DAF, so it can continuously run and then feed into a tank that, uh, that we can dose up to the bed. So um, I don't know if we actually put a size to it, uh, Councillor, but uh, yeah. I, I, I honestly, I can't remember, but I, I would estimate something in the range of uh, 20 to 30 cubic meters, like 20 to 30,000 liters, like not, not a huge tank. It's more of a buffer tank, uh, like an equalization tank. Okay, thanks. And the final question was the, the lagoons, the two big, Lagoons, they're emptied out usually every two or three years. I know Lindsay empties out their lagoons and they're spread, they're, they're MOE certified, they're spread on fields for fertilizer. Um, mm -hmm. If those were, were um, emptied out, would that not give us some more leeway here, some more capacity while we work on this um, upgrade? When they clean out the lagoons, they're essentially, they're just removing the sludge from the bottom. Uh, which builds up over time. You know, at a mechanical sewage plant, you get your uh, your solids building up, um, but they go to a digester and then sludge storage, and then they're removed to a field, a, a, a generally removed to a agricultural field, as you're talking about. But that's done on a regular basis. Normally, with the lagoon system, it's it's like a little bit more uh, spaced out. They don't. There's not usually enough of a buildup to warrant cleaning them out every year. But that. The stuff in the bottom of the lagoon isn't very solid. It's it's typically running at about four or five percent solid, so it's like ninety six percent water. So really, when they uh, 
uh, the short answer is no, it doesn't, it doesn't really give you a whole lot of capacity. If you let it get way out of hand and you start getting a lot of weeds and, and really solid stuff growing in the bottom, then it can start chewing up your capacity. And if you never do anything about it, that's what happens. So you definitely need to clean them, but, uh, no, in the short term, it doesn't, it, it, or even in the long term, it really doesn't give you a whole lot of, of sort of capacity hydraulically. Okay. Thanks. And your presentation, would it be available online? For people yes. to see the public to see it's online in the city website. I um, believe Ashley. Uh, Ashley will help us up there, but yes. Yeah. I, okay, thank you. Thanks. Thank So if that's the only question, that sort of wraps up the presentation. We will have this posted on the website. Uh, it's also on YouTube, as mentioned before. So anyone can go back and listen to this uh, presentation on YouTube. Uh, Tony, what do we have a comment period? We, we, what's the mechanism for the public to comment? It's a good question. Um, we'll, we'll, I'll work with Ashley and make sure that, that that is available on the website because yes, Thank you for that. We would, we'd be happy to hear any of your comments and, and uh, we'll set it up so that you can, we'll, we'll take attendance here, of course, but uh, yes, we'd, we'd be happy to hear any feedback and that will be on the website with the presentation of mechanism to, uh, to kind of leave your comments. Excellent. And the end of the process, just so everyone's aware and Councilor Ashmore, uh, you also, that uh, ultimately we do have to take a report back to council with the preferred solution. Uh, I'm not totally, I'm not sure we're talk targeting the end of this year or early next year to take that final report uh, to council for endorsement. Uh, and then that's how we close off uh, the project. So that's the end result. The end result would be uh, the study or the, the EA would be co completed. We will file a notice of project completion and we will take it to council for endorsement uh, and for public input again. So there, there is gonna be several uh, mechanisms to, to uh, provide the public a platform uh, to comment if required. But again, we're not really changing anything. Uh, the spray irrigation has been around for a long time. Uh, we are now just formalizing it so that we could do uh, both spray irrigation and subsurface in tandem. So we have a redu redundancy because uh, before if the spray irrigation went down, we had nowhere to go or the lagoon system went in capacity, we had nowhere to go. So now uh, our proposal is to utilize both systems, utilize the subsurface uh, system with some improvements and utilize the spray irrigation uh, so that it accommodates growth and it, there's built in redundancy. So if we have to do maintenance on one of the two systems, we don't have to take the whole entire system offline. Uh, there's really no environmental impact or you know, we've been monitoring the system uh, for decades. Uh, so from an environmental point of view, it, it's sound uh, and it, it, it drastically improves operation capacity of, of the existing system if this is the uh, preferred solution ultimately. Uh, so I think it's good news for the uh, village of Omini. Yeah, so, um, go ahead. <laughs> so growth can still occur, like there's no hold on growth or anything like that? No, no, so, and I want to distinguish between, there's two different types of growth, right? So um, growth on a, a fully service system uh, or growth on private, private well and septics, uh, which can still happen independently. Uh, the, there was an EA done, as, as Tony mentioned, uh, I believe 2014, regarding expanding water in Omimi that came to council. Uh, and the resolution was uh, the status quo. So there's only a small section of Omimi that's on uh, municipal water. The rest of Omimi is on either uh, communal wells or private wells. Uh, so there is still a mechanism for growth utilizing uh, non-municipal services. So uh, any growth questions really should be directed to the growth management plan that our planning department has uh, started. Uh, that will uh, go through the end of 2022, and it will look at growth holistically throughout the city of Porth Lakes, not just in Omibi, 
uh, in accordance with various provincial policies. Okay, thanks. Yeah, that, that was an important point and I forgot to, I don't know that I elaborated on that, but there are various steps uh, for public consultation and uh, this is one of them. Uh, there'll be a second one outlining the preferred solution. So there'll be another chance for public input at that point or the preferred design, sorry, kind of the final design. And uh, once that's done, there'll be a report uh, prepared uh, an environmental study report, and that will need to be endorsed by council, and then it will be posted on the uh, the ministry website and advertised um, so that people get another chance to comment at that stage. And if there are, you know, big big concerns that aren't uh, there, there are there are ways for. Uh, where concerns to be weight, there's, there's lots of mechanisms in place, I guess, to, to for people to voice their concerns and, and steps along the way to, to resolve those. Hello, sir. Can't hear you. I can see you. Very sorry. It looks like you're unmuted. Uh, Ian, you might want to use the chat box. It looks like there's something wrong with your audio. At the bottom of the screen, there's a little chat box uh, right in the bottom middle. If you click that chat box, then you can type in your question. Um, you might, you're having some audio problems. I'm hoping you can hear me. While, uh, perfect, you can hear me. <laughs> so if you wanna type in your, uh, again, you're experiencing some technical difficulties with audio, but if you wanna type in your question, we'll do our best to answer it. In the meantime, uh, Joe, Janet, and Chris and Samuel, you're still with us. Uh, if you have any questions, feel free to just to jump in uh, and ask away. Yeah, Councillor Ashmore, you asked me about the growth uh, potential. So for the system we're proposing, which is currently what's actually running, right. th that should be able to support approximately 370 homes, like additional homes on that system. Um, you know, the water would be, it, uh, that, doesn't, that doesn't account for any water. Like that's not the water to, to, to service those homes, right. but to, to the sewage system itself, would be able to handle approximately 370 additional homes. Well, one of the problems we had before we did the major work in 2014, 13 was stormwater and it was causing, uh, they had to have emergency discharges into the river, which aren't good. Mm -hmm. So that, that was the main thing. So um, that caused all this, you know, thought of uh, to getting this, this, um, uh, this remedy, but um, will we still be able to handle all the storm water right now as the capacity is at present? That is based on your most recent flows, yes. So that's looking at your flows over your, the past three or four years. And uh, I believe a, there was quite a bit of work done in Omimi to try and tighten the system up over over certain periods of time as well. So you know, that that's accounting for, for flows into the uh, into the system as they exist now. Yeah, uh, Tony, just to add on that, uh, Councillor Ashmore, we did uh, undertake the, um, the uh, repair, I guess, and expansion of the Sturgeon uh, pump station. Right. Uh, we installed some bladders in our sanitary system and we did replace some uh, sanitary pipe, uh, which were, were ex er in areas where we were experiencing high influent infiltration. So that did address it. Uh, so we, you know, to a certain degree, have uh, mitigated uh, some of the infiltration measures due to storm. All right, thanks. Tony, so Mr. Drever has uh, 
put in a question it, just for the uh, the YouTube audience. I guess I'm not sure if they see it. Do you mind uh, just reading the, his question and then hopefully answering it? Yes. Oh, thank you. I'm in. Uh, I'm interested in the growth projection and how that might be handled through the development charges. I believe the previous improvements were partially paid through for through DC reserves, and yet growth was not realized. It is important. Oh, sorry. Is this improvement essentially to recapture the previous intended design flow under the previous ECA? Not sure about the development charges. I'll let Juan speak to that, but I will say that uh, yes, this this essentially gives you uh, the flow that was was initially intended under the previous ECA. I would say that's that's fairly accurate. Yes, you know. Give or take. Yeah. So, in regards to the DC charge, uh, the DC charge, there's a term on it, right? So we we revisit or we revise our DCs every uh, four or five years in that time frame. And when we do the background study for the DCs, we take the plan and horizon, which I think is 2031 or 2035, uh, somewhere in that time frame. So we look at all the growth uh, that's going to happen in that plan and horizon. And then we look at all the inter, uh, infrastructure improvements that have to happen. And that's how we come up with our DC charge in a nutshell, right? So uh, we do re recon reconciliate it every uh, year as we go. So again, the DC costs, uh, the infrastructure costs are based on estimates, right? Uh, sometimes the estimates are high, sometimes they're low. So we, we um, the truth it every so often. Uh, so uh, during the next cycle of the DC, they would be captured and they would be funneled into the new rate uh, and adjusted uh, as, it, as required. So that's how they're, uh, they're sort of structured. There was talk on a, a municipal capital charge or individual DC for Mimi that we had looked at a few years ago, uh, both for sewer and water, but that has since uh, been uh, retired. Uh, so we're not going through that methodology anymore. Uh, it was very contentious at the time. <laughs> I attended some public meetings, uh, and it was uh, it, it was uh, there was a burden, uh, a potential financial burden on Omimi, especially with the water. That's why council decided, uh, yes, in theory, it's good to expand water everywhere on Omimi, but the cost of it was prohibitive. Uh, so that's why we decided uh, the status quo is good, and we encourage. Uh, development for water on individual wells or communal systems because that lessens the burden on the existing rate pairs in Omi. Excellent. So I think, uh, not to see any questions, I think that is it, Tony. We could probably wrap up. Uh, so okay, and as we mentioned, we'll make sure that this is listed on the, uh, the, the presentation is shown on the website, and we'll make it clear how to leave comments um, as well. Excellent. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for a, if you were a very captive audience. Thank you. <laughs> and quiet. So Ashley, we could stop recording now.